Hello everybody and welcome to Kenya, 2,500 miles from where you've been watching that spectacularly beautiful lioness and her little cubbies. It's very nice to have you with us and remember you can ask us any questions you like. My name is James Hendry and I am sitting up in the migration control room in the Masai Mara. Now we're going to take you down to the river where we've got lots of beautiful hippopotamus. Look, there they are. They're sitting under the water, even though it's a chilly day here, you know, it's probably only about, ooh, I'd say not much more than 60 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And those hippos still like to be in the water because you know what? They're really, really very fat indeed. And that keeps them nice and warm. Now you can't see me, of course, but you can't see me because I'm sitting a long way away from this river. And I'll show you where I'm sitting a little bit later. Now, Mrs. Dugan, um, you may have heard me say that the temperature here is 60 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that's probably what it is. It might be up to 65, but there's a chilly wind blowing, which always makes it feel that much colder. Now, what we have here, everybody, is a river crossing. Now, what does that mean if there's nothing crossing it? Well, this is the very famous Mara River in Kenya. And in the Mara River, it has, well, there are many, many stories about the Mara River, but the biggest story, of course, is that of the wildebeest migration and the crossings that those wildebeest make over this river again and again and again, hoping not to be eaten by something I've just spotted over here, I think. Is that one? No, I think that's just mud. But somewhere lurking in this river, everybody, is a great big group of crocodiles and those crocodiles wait for the wildebeest, there's one, for the wildebeest and the zebra and the Thompson's gazelles and the topi and the eland to try and cross the river and then they eat them. Look at this enormous crocodile, now he's swimming very, very slowly up stream and it's cold for him too and so he won't be moving very fast but this crocodile will weigh well probably as much as 1,600 pounds, can you believe it? That's an enormous amount. He's got a huge big head that's probably about the size of, oh, I don't know, I'm going to say if you're 9 and 10 years old, it's probably about the same size as your body from the tip of your head down to your waist. So he's got, he's a huge fellow and probably about, oh, I don't know, maybe about, nine or ten feet long up to 12 feet sometimes isn't he huge look at his eyes just only slightly open as he watches where he's going he'll be using his sense of smell probably much more than he's using his sense of sight to see where he's going now, Jonah, you are wondering why hippos open their mouths so wide. Well, Jonah, that's a very good question for someone of your name, of course, because I'm sure you know the story of Jonah who was swallowed by the whale. So perhaps you're worried that one day you might be swallowed by a hippopotamus. Don't worry, you will not be swallowed by a hippopotamus. They open their mouths so very wide, Jonah, because... Let me try and find your hippo again. Because what they do is they, well, sometimes they're just yawning, you know, like you're new tired, but often it's when they are trying to show other hippopotamus that this is their area. So they show that this is my area and look how big my teeth are and I want you to go away. So that's why they do that. These guys seem to be very calm indeed. Now, Destiny, you want to know how hippopotamus defend themselves. And the next time you come back to Kenya, after I've sent you back to South Africa, I'm going to show you some special uh, skulls and things that we have over here. And then I will be able to show you the teeth that the hippopotamus have. And that's how they defend themselves. Can we go across to Dusty Crossing, please? Yeah, we have another crossing point. And I'm just wondering, we had some hippos fighting here earlier. And they've got huge big teeth, about the size of your forearm, believe it or not. And I'll show you those the next time you come across to me here. Isn't that lovely? We've got a beautiful bird sitting there. No wildebeest and zebra are crossing the rivers today because it's just a little bit cold. Now that bird is called a yellow-billed stork. 
Amira, you want to know what kind of birds live in Africa? Well, Amira, there's one of them. <coughs> that is a yellow-billed stork. And Amira, there are more than 1,200 species of bird that live here in Africa, so I can't really tell you all of them. But you get eagles and vultures and buzzards and storks and herons and sparrows and grenadiers and finches and sunbirds and cisticulars and larks and warblers and parrots and lovebirds and taracos and stints and petrels and lots of different kinds of birds. You can see about 1,400 different kinds in Africa. Remember, Africa is much, much bigger than the United States. And so you know how many birds there are just in your small part of the United States. So you can imagine how many there are here in Africa where there are not nearly so many people per square unit of area, which you don't need to worry about. OK, that is the yellow-billed stork. Let's go back to Byron. I'll try and fix some skulls for you to look at next time you come here.